I'd like to begin by thanking the excellent staff members of the Political Science Department and also of College Development for their hard work in organizing uh, tonight's program. So there will be a uh, reception following the discussion uh, just outside the hall, and I welcome everybody to join in. Um, uh, unfortunately, time will preclude us from, from having questions from the audience, but um, the panelists will stick around and, and answer some questions at the reception after, so I encourage you to, to uh, join in at that. Um, we're very proud of the department's uh, public programming and um, of all of the public programming that's offered across the university. Um, if you'd like to help support that programming, please contact me or College Development um, following the talk. Uh, I'm also very proud of all of you uh, for forsaking ESPN's live coverage of the NFL draft tonight uh, in order to become better informed citizens. Um, this is important to do, um, but I will just have one caveat to that, which is that um, um, if you know who the Philadelphia Eagles drafted, don't tell me. Um, I'm, I'm recording it at home. So, almost uh, 20 years ago uh, to the day, on April 19, 1995, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols killed 168 people and injured some 680 others by detonating a bomb uh, that destroyed the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Uh, part of the militia movement, McVeigh and Nichols targeted ATF and FBI offices because they were angered by the federal government's actions in the Waco standoff with David Koresh's Branch Davidians in March of 1993. And, in, and by the 1992 standoff with Randy Weaver in Ruby Ridge. While a crystallizing political event of its time, less than a decade later, the Oklahoma City bombing was overshadowed by the events of 9-11 and the turn towards concerns over international, and a turn towards concerns over international terrorism. However, in recent years, attention has once again begun to focus on a resurgence of the extreme anti-federal government ideology that motivated McVeigh and Nichols. This ideology is long-standing and particularly strong in the West uh, with its vast federal land holdings. Most recently, the militia movement has been revived by Clive and Bundy's long-standing dispute with BLM, one that actually goes back to 1993 uh, between the Waco and Oklahoma City bo uh, bombing dates. That dispute uh, related to grazing, uh, grazing fees and the use of public lands um, has escalated to near crisis levels as recently as last April. Similar echoes of the militia and patriot movements have also been manifest in the current Minuteman movement of citizen border monitoring and interdiction. The central tendons of this populist anti-government ideology have entered the political mainstream um, uh, with the introduction of uh, so-called Bundy bills uh, in 10 western states authorizing the seizure of U.S. public lands within their borders. Presidential hopeful Ted Cruz has lamented the Bundy standoff as liberty under assault. And, on, and under social media, the anxiety, uh, the anxiety over the military exercise, a military exercise to take place in the southwestern states in the coming months called Operation Jade Helm 15 has gone viral. One concer concerned citizen told the Austin American statesman, it's the same thing as happened in Nazi Germany. They're gathering intelligence and they're moving logistics in place for martial law. Google lists, in fact, over 560,000 internet references to Operation Jade Helm. And in the last few days, Governor Abbott of Texas has ordered members of the Texas State Guard to monitor the federal troops participating in this, um, in this maneuver. In light of the 20-year anniversary and the recent resurgence uh, of the militia movement and its ideology, uh, we are pleased to have with us tonight Steve Zipperstein, who will help us to better understand the events of Oklahoma City and Waco with an eye towards how those events and their consequences can help to contextualize and inform um, our contemporary political landscape. Uh, Steve will be in conversation with our own Michael Lofchi. Uh, Mike is past department chair and currently serves as associate dean of social sciences. Mike joined UCLA in 1964, making this his 50th year of service to the university. Uh, and I'd like to first have everyone thank me and uh, join me in thanking Mike. <laughs> thank me. Thank me for keeping me. Thank you. Over that time, Mike has taught generations of UTL UCLA students, including a young Lou Alcindor, uh, the 70 or so uh, that he takes on a travel study program to London and Paris uh, each year, and no doubt uh, many of you uh, who may have taken African politics or introduction to comparative politics with Professor Lofchi. Mike is a noted scholar of African politics. His most recent book, The Political Economy of Tanzania, Decline and Recovery, was published by University of Pennsylvania Press just last year. 
When I asked Mike to recall his most memorable students, he told me, well, Kareem was the most famous, but Steve Zipperstein was the most memorable and the one that he's remained the closest to uh, ever since. Steve is a 1979 graduate of our department and earned his JD uh, at UC Davis Law School. He's currently Chief Legal Officer for BlackBerry Limited, uh, which you will recognize as the folks who make the email device belonging to President Obama that the Russians didn't hack over the weekend. <laughs> Before joining uh, BlackBerry, he was Vice President of Legal and External Affairs, General Counsel and Secretary for Verizon Wireless, uh, responsible for that company's legal, regulatory compliance, and federal and state public policy matters. More important for tonight's discussion, however, is that prior to moving to the telecom industry, Steve served as Chief Assistant uh, United States Attorney in Los Angeles and held a variety of positions in the Justice Department in Washington during both the first Bush and Clinton administrations. Most importantly, he worked closely with Attorney General Janet Reno at the time of Waco in Oklahoma City and was her counsel in the 1995 Waco Congressional Investigation hearing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Lofchi and Steve Zipperstein. Jeff, uh, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, even though it did include a reminder that this is my 50th year on the faculty. I can only say it's been 50 years of utmost pleasure and delight. One of the great pleasures and delights of being a faculty member here uh, has been to have Steve Zipperstein as a student. I know that you're all very anxious to hear what he has to say about those events that Jeff referenced, so we'll begin right away. Uh, Steve. Uh, remind us, if you would, of the chronology of these events, just to put them in a historical context for us. Sure. Thank you, and um, thank everyone for being here tonight. It's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be with you. Um, if I could just, uh, because I'm a lawyer, I do have to say a couple of disclaimers. I'm speaking tonight in my personal capacity, not on behalf of my current or any of my former employers, especially not on behalf of the U.S. Department of Justice or the U.S. Attorney's Office in downtown LA. And uh, secondly, um, I'm going to be speaking about things that are part of the public record. If you came here tonight expecting some new revelation or something uh, shocking that hasn't been said before, I'm go going to have to disappoint you. I'm very, very sorry. Um, but it is quite helpful, though, uh, to put in context 20 years after these events, uh, sort of what happened at the, at the time and how it happened and and, and what we learned and what lessons that may hold for us going forward. And so Professor Lewis mentioned Ruby Ridge, which many of you may recall, uh, involved uh, the US Marshal Service originally in August of 1992, attempting to serve a warrant uh, in northern Idaho, Ruby Ridge, Idaho, on a fellow by the name of Randy Weaver, uh, who lived in, in a cabin uh, with his wife Vicki, their son, 13-year-old son, Sammy and a friend, uh, Kevin Harris. And when the marshals came, uh, there was a gunfight. Uh, Sammy and Kevin were involved in a gunfight with the marshals. Unfortunately, Sammy was killed. And Deputy United States Marshal Billy Deegan was also killed uh, in that gunfight. And that led the FBI to take over the situation. They sent in their elite hostage rescue team, which is based in Quantico, Virginia which is a US Marine Corps base, but also where the FBI has its academy and where the hostage rescue team is based. Um, and then eventually, uh, a, a, and we'll call that the HRT, hostage rescue team, an HRT sniper a few days later uh, sh fired a shot from his sniper rifle, which unfortunately struck Vicki Weaver, Randy Weaver's wife, and killed her. Um, and uh, that's important, and we'll come back to Ruby Ridge. So that, that's August of 1992. November of 1992, Bill Clinton is elected president of the United States of America uh, and is inaugurated January 20th, 1993. Now, uh, incoming President Clinton had been picking his cabinet members, and you may recall he nominated a relatively young, fairly unknown lawyer named Zoe Baird. Remember that name, Zoe Baird, to be the attorney general? Uh, and it turned out that the uh, then chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Joe Biden, a Democrat from Delaware, um, called the White House and said, you know, we've done our background on Ms. Baird, and it turns out that she has a nanny for whom she hasn't paid uh, the applicable Social Security taxes. So Ms. Baird had to withdraw. And then there was another nominee, uh, a federal judge named Kimba Wood from New York. And a few days later, Senator Biden had to call the White House again 
and said, well, we've been doing our background checking, and it turns out we found a photograph of Judge Wood dressed in a Playboy bunny outfit. She worked at the Playboy Club in London when she was a college student to make money, uh, but in those days, that was a disqualifier to be the Attorney General of the United States. And so then the White House received a phone call from the president of the American Bar Association, who was a lawyer in, in, in uh, Tampa, Florida. And he said, look, we've got a great Attorney General uh, in Florida, State Attorney General. Her name is Janet Reno, and the White House had never heard of her. But on the recommendation of the president of the ABA, they nominated Ms. Reno. Uh, so while all of this was going on, and before she became the Attorney General, on February the 26th, just five weeks after President Clinton took office, February 26, 1993, was the first attack at the World Trade Center in New York. Truck bomb explodes in the parking garage under the World Trade Center. Eight people die. Two days later, that was a Friday, two days later, Sunday, February 28, 1993, we still don't have an Attorney General. We had a holdover from the first Bush administration, uh, Stuart Gerson, who was the acting attorney general. Two days later, after the World Trade Center attack, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which had been investigating this compound called the Branch Davidians, or cult, or whatever word you want to use, um, investigating them for possession of unlawful weapons, the ATF had gone to a federal judge in Waco, Texas, and obtained uh, upon a showing of probable cause, a warrant to search the premises of the compound, and a warrant for the arrest of the leader of the Branch Davidians, whose name was Vernon Howell, but who went by the name David Koresh. So the ATF agents went to effectuate the search warrant and the arrest warrant on Sunday morning, February 28, 1993, and when they arrived there, uh, gunshots came in their direction from inside the compound. Four ATF agents were killed that day, the largest loss of life in ATF history. Um, several people, including Mr. Koresh, inside the compound were wounded. And again, the HRT, same as Ruby Ridge, the same HRT, including the same sniper that killed Vicki Weaver, were sent to Waco to take over the situation. That was February 28th. On March the 12th, the U.S. Senate confirmed Janet Reno as the Attorney General of the United States. So she came into office and inherited the bombing of the World Trade Center and the FBI siege surrounding of Waco. And then a few weeks after that, that was March 12th, April the 19th, on the recommendation of the FBI, Ms. Reno, uh, and she had notified the White House of this in advance, gave the order for the FBI to send in vehicles, tank-like vehicles, that were equipped with spray nozzles to spray CS tear gas inside the compound to knock holes in the corners of the compound and spray in tear gas. And about six hours, that began at about six in the morning. About six hours after that began, a fire erupted and 75 people inside the compound died. Nine survived. And so that's sort of the historical context of Waco and Ruby Ridge. That was April the 19th, 1993. Two years exactly to the day later, April 19th, 1995, was the bombing of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. And when it first happened, you may remember, because we still had fresh in our minds the attack on the World Trade Center back in 1993, two years earlier, everyone thought, oh my gosh, this is a, a Middle Eastern or a Middle Eastern inspired terrorist attack on US soil. It was only after uh, the FBI and local law enforcement were able to recover a piece of the truck that exploded and match the serial number to the rental agreement that Terry Nichols had signed that we realized this had nothing to do whatsoever with the Middle East. Mr. Nichols and Timothy McVeigh were, as Professor Lewis said, inspired by a desire to extract revenge on the federal government for what they viewed as a crime that the federal government perpetrated at Waco two years to the day earlier. When this happened, when, the, when we realized that this was a, sort of a revenge attack for Waco, the US Congress, which had previously conducted hearings and investigations back in 1993, decided that they needed to do an entirely brand new investigation, soup to nuts, so two congressional committees were merged together, 
35 members of the U.S. Congress, almost 10% of the U.S. Congress, House of Representatives, were formed into a sort of a super committee and held a very extensive investigation, conducted an, an extensive investigation, and then held 10 days of televised hearings in the summer of 1995. So that's sort of a chronology of the events. Steve, how did you happen to become involved in all of this, and what was your role? So I had been a federal prosecutor here in Los Angeles uh, from uh, 1987. Uh, I was uh, uh, doing the typical work of the federal prosecutor here in LA, bank robberies, drug uh, trafficking, uh, all kinds of cases. And then in 1988 or so, we had the savings and loan crisis. Everyone remember that? Uh, Lincoln Savings and Keating and all of that. Well, sort of ground zero for the savings and loan crisis was uh, Tampa, Florida, Dallas, Texas, and Orange County, California. And uh, I wound up trying, doing the jury trial, in the first case in the country against the owners of a savings and loan that, that failed, that went bankrupt, at a huge cost to the taxpayers. And um, as a result of that, I, I be, uh, uh, was invited to Washington a few times to do some training for other prosecutors and federal agents who were doing similar investigations of bank fraud around the country. Uh, then we had the Rodney King riots, you remember, in Los Angeles uh, in 1992. And following uh, those riots, and I was involved in the federal response to those riots, I was invited by the then Attorney General in the first Bush administration to come to Washington, D.C. to work for him and for Bob Mueller, who you may remember was the FBI director most recently. At that time, uh, Mr. Mueller was the head of the criminal division in the Justice Department. I was not a political appointee. I was a civil servant from the federal prosecutor's office in Los Angeles on loan to the Justice Department. And when the election came and Bill Clinton was elected, the Republicans were ousted, the Democrats came in, and here I was still, as a civil servant, serving in Washington, D.C. When the uh, fire occurred on April the 19th, 1993, at Waco, um, uh, Attorney General Reno um, asked me, as a not a political appointee, someone with no political ambition, uh, to work together with another federal prosecutor who she had known in Miami uh, to do an investigation of the White House, FBI, and Justice Department role in the events leading to April 19, 1993. We worked on that for several months. We produced a report which is public, and I have some excerpts which I may refer to later this evening. Um, and then after the Murrah bombing in 1995, I was already back in Los Angeles. I was the chief assistant U.S. attorney. Ms. Reno called and asked me to come back to Washington and be her counselor during the upcoming congressional hearings which occurred in the summer of 1995. Steve, uh, what process did you use to facilitate the uh, federal investigation of what had happened at uh, Waco and uh, subsequently? So we're talking now about 1993, the time period after the Waco fire. Really the next day, uh, I was asked to um, uh, be part of the investigative team. It consisted of six people, three FBI agents from a section of the FBI that sort of internal affairs that does internal investigations, uh, and then three prosecutors, myself, this fellow from Miami I mentioned, and someone from, again, from the Internal Affairs Office of Professional Responsibility section at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, we worked together as a team for the next five months. Uh, we more or less divided up the work. Um, my area of focus was um, uh, really um, on the um, uh, religious experts that the FBI consulted, the uh, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists who were experts uh, in suicide and suicide ideation because uh, the FBI was keenly interested in trying to get a sense as to whether or not any action that they would take might or might not prompt a mass suicide inside the, the compound. And so there was, uh, that was the focus of our investigation. Um, and I also uh, was involved in interviews at the White House. For example, I personally interviewed Mac McClarty, who was President Clinton's chief of staff. I interviewed Bernard Nussbaum, who was the White House counsel. Um, we, we asked for uh, an interview, a face-to-face -face interview with the president, and we were told instead that we should submit written questions, which we did, and we received written answers, and those were also included in our, in our public report. Um, we worked together as a team, as I said. Ultimately, we compiled about a 
a 350, 400 page long report, uh, which was published immediately. Separate from us, there was a separate investigation by the Treasury Department, which investigated the role of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms in the initial encounter on February 28th that led to the shootout. Uh, we looked at that, but that was not the focus of our investigation. It was the events beginning with the arrival of the FBI and for the next 56 days through the fire. I think we're starting to get uh, very close to the substantive content of the investigation that uh, you pursued about these sad and tragic events. Steve, can you tell us what the uh, contents were? Uh, what was the uh, substantive finding of the investigation that had taken place? So our investigation uh, found that the, I guess the most important conclusion is that the, the fire that destroyed the compound was started from inside the compound. It was not started by the FBI. I know this has been a point of tremendous controversy in the last 20 years. How did the fire start? Who started it? Did the FBI fire incendiary tear gas projectiles into the compound? Um, our conclusion that the uh, fire was started from within the compound was based on a number of different uh, pieces of evidence. And let me just briefly recount those. And again, this is all in, in, in our report. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, the investigative team, obtained permission from the federal judge in Texas who was overseeing the criminal side of the investigation. As I said, nine people survived and some of them were, were prosecuted because of the deaths of the ATF agents. The federal judge overseeing the, the case gave us permission uh, to make public uh, some um, uh, recordings of conversations from inside the compound that the FBI was able to obtain. Um, the FBI, during the 56 days, was able to, through various means, uh, have some listening devices taken inside the compound. And as a result, we had tape recordings of conversations from inside. The people did not know they were being recorded. And um, let me just read to you. You might, uh, because I think in their own words, it is more compelling than me summarizing it for you. Um, as I said, the um, FBI action began at about 6 o'clock in the morning on April the 19th, 1993. Uh, and at um, 6.05 AM, one of the listening devices overheard an unidentified male say uh, to a Branch Davidian named Pablo Cohen, Pablo, have you poured it yet? Pablo says, huh? Have you poured it yet? Pablo, yes, in the hallway. Five minutes later, uh, OK, Pablo was overheard. And then we overhear David Koresh for the first time that morning. Don't pour it all out. We might need some later. And then an unidentified female says, get ready for the gas. And then a man says, they're throwing tear gas at us. Um, at 6.16 AM, about 11 minutes later, Koresh was overheard uh, on the listening devices talking to his top lieutenant, a fellow by the name of Steve Schneider. Koresh said, all right, they got their fuel around here? Schneider, yeah, everybody. And then an unidentified male says, I poured it already. And another un unidentified male says, these guys poured it already. An hour and five minutes later at 7.21 AM, there's more discussion about fuel and an unidentified male says, I got the fuel. We should have gotten more hay, more hay in here. And then two hours later, so the, imagine the FBI is punching holes, spraying tear gas in while these conversations are going on. It's now 9.20 AM, three hours and 20 minutes after the FBI action began. Koresh, David Koresh was overheard saying the following on our listening devices. They got two cans of Coleman fuel down there, huh? Steve Schneider, his lieutenant, empty. Koresh, all of it? Schneider, think so. Koresh, did you check? Schneider, nothing there. Koresh, out of both cans? Schneider, I've got some mineral oil here. Do you want mineral oil? I've got some mineral oil. So we have that. That's one sort of uh, uh, evidentiary uh, item that we relied upon for our conclusion that there was at least discussion 
that sounds like preparation to start a fire inside. Also, on that day, during the six hours, the FBI had a plane flying overhead equipped with forward-looking infrared radar. And the forward-looking infrared radar showed at around noontime, within about a two-minute time span, three simultaneous eruptions of heat at three different points in the compound. And those were three places where we did not have the FBI injecting gas or firing uh, gas canisters. So again, we believe that that's consistent with what we heard on these tapes. Okay? Uh, and of course, we also have the testimony of every FBI agent, interviews of every FBI agent who was there on the scene. Um, and um, uh, there was just no evidence whatsoever that any incendiary uh, action in terms of um, uh, uh, ability to start a fire, um, anything of that nature occurred from the government side on that day. So that was our conclusion. Now, I must say that, that we overlooked during our investigation um, that there was uh, in a drawer in the FBI Academy in Quantico uh, one incendiary tear gas canister. We didn't find that in our investigation. And a couple of years later, uh, actually three, four years after our investigation, there was a reinvestigation conducted by former U.S. Senator John Danforth. Um, his team appropriately criticized our team for not finding that uh, one tear gas canister, but they came to the same conclusion that we did, that the fire was started from inside the compound. There were also multiple congressional investigations, 1993, 1995, they also came to the same conclusion uh, that we did. I should also, uh, maybe I'm going on a bit too long here, but, but one more finding that I thought was interesting. Um, the key, of course, was who started the fire, but there was also a question, a lot of questions about, you know, why did the FBI, why did they do this? Why, you know, they waited 56 days. Why didn't they wait longer? Were the people inside really a threat? Was there really, were there really weapons inside? Uh, when the fire was, was over and it was safe enough uh, to go inside, let me just give you a quick inventory of what was found inside the compound. Uh, and by the way, the people that searched the compound were not the FBI. The Texas Rangers took over uh, the, the, the scene after the FBI action and the deaths because it certainly made sense, uh, given the FBI's involvement, for an independent agency, the Texas Rangers, to come in. And what they found inside the compound were Hundreds of exploded shells, not from the FBI, but, but shells that, were, that had blown up because of the heat of the, of the fire. Uh, some fired shells, uh, some bullets, and let me tell you how many bullets, 390,960 rounds were found inside. Kevlar helmets, Kevlar vests, camouflage outfits, hand grenades, pistols, rifles, shotguns, rocket projectiles, gas masks, chemical warfare suits, military assault knives, and fuel cans, Coleman fuel cans. Uh, most of the ammunition were 22 caliber shells, but there were quite a few 50 caliber shells. And uh, I'm not a firearms expert, and I have no military experience, but um, the, the, the law enforcement and military people I spoke to said that a 50 caliber a uh, bullet or 50 caliber shell in the hands of a skilled sniper can easily, uh, if fired from the, for example, the capital of the United States, easily take out a target in the White House all the way down Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the kind of ammunition that they had. On the day of the fire, we also concluded that the FBI didn't fire a single shot, but they took a lot of incoming bullet fire from inside the compound. So those were our main findings. Steve, let me uh, raise one more question of a, uh, again, all of this I know is very controversial material. Uh, in explaining its uh, sense of urgency about taking action with respect to the compound, there were allegations about the treatment of children by Koresh in the compound. Uh, did the investigation deal with that aspect and what were its findings? Yep. So uh, one of the uh, when we asked Attorney General Reno, why did you go in 
when you did after 56 days? Why couldn't you wait 57 days or 56 months for that matter? Um, her answer was that she had been advised by the FBI that there were many children inside the compound, which was true, uh, and that uh, children were being sexually abused by Koresh um, and uh, some of his followers. Now, remember I said Koresh was wounded during the gunfight with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms on February the 28th. And he was really in no position physically. He was nursing a wound to the abdomen. He was in no position physically to be sexually abusing anyone uh, during those 56 days. And so we were, we were not really able to reach a conclusion one way or another about whether there, there had been sexual abuse maybe in the past of children and that it might reoccur if Koresh recovered and was allowed to stay inside. But we did know for sure that the conditions inside the compound were, 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 were not good. Um, we knew that because some people came out of the compound during the 56 days and were interviewed by the FBI and recounted that conditions were not good inside the compound. We also knew from people who had joined the Branch Davidians and then left, and again, this is pre-February 28th, that when people joined the Branch Davidians, the expectation was that if they were married, if they had a girlfriend, um, that, uh, that the female companion became a wife to Koresh. And we, we, we did establish for sure that uh, Koresh uh, had multiple uh, sex partners inside the compound. Now, I'm not, please, I'm not saying that, and our report certainly does not say that this justified going in on day 56 versus day 57 versus month 56. This remains an area of tremendous controversy, tremendous controversy. But what I will say is that the Attorney General, Ms. Reno, um, we, we concluded in our report, and I think that it's, uh, I mean, you have video of her testifying before Congress. You can watch the video. You can make your own decision one way or the other about this. But her consistent testimony, uh, her, her statements to us, congressional testimony, television interviews, her consistent uh, statements have been that when the FBI said there are children being abused, the conditions are squalid, um, our agents have been laying basically on their bellies for 56 days surrounding this compound, we need to do something to bring this to an end. She asked uh, lots and lots of questions. She took the entire uh, weekend, April 19th was a Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, she had Delta Force come in and she asked them, if you were me, what would you do? Would you wait longer or would you go in now? Do you believe what the FBI is saying? What is your professional opinion? She grilled the FBI agents. She talked to, to, to the experts, some of the experts at least, not all of them, but some of them. Um, in the corporate world, we call this doing your due diligence. And um, there was a lot of evidence that Ms. Reno conducted a very thorough due diligence of the situation before she made her decision. This was an extraordinarily difficult decision for her, an extraordinarily difficult decision. It was a decision that, that, that um, we were convinced she did not take lightly. It was a, a decision for which she uh, uh, discharged her responsibility as Attorney General to make sure that she uh, sought information from as many available sources as possible and did not just rely on what the FBI was saying to her, but it was an extraordinarily uh, difficult and, and, of course, to this day, very controversial decision. So, Steve, we have uh, three controversial, <laughs> we have three, uh, really, uh, at least three points of controversy, the setting of the fires, uh, the armaments, and the social human conditions uh, within the compound. What were your personal impressions about the investigation and what it showed? Well, as, as I said, we, we did make a mistake, and which led to a reinvestigation. Um, and you know, uh, over the course of history, there may be further investigations. This is an issue for which uh, there are very, very strong feelings and strong passions. And um, I, I don't want to say that the investigation that we did in the first six months, although we were confident that we did a thorough and fair job, I, don't, I certainly wouldn't want to say that that is the definitive historical record. We'll leave that to history, and we'll leave that to future uh, generations of 
historians and, 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 and other scholars and interested parties. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that um, none of us who were involved in the investigation had um, any political pressure that was put on us to um, in any way shape or, or skew the investigation uh, in a particular direction. We were free to pursue the facts as we found them. Uh, we had the full cooperation of everyone we spoke to. Um, we, in our report, are very, were very candid about describing tension between, for example, the hostage rescue team of the FBI and the FBI negotiators. Uh, I didn't really talk about the negotiators. Um, as, you, as you kind of see in the movies, the FBI does have a team of behavioral scientists and negotiators also based in Quantico. They came to uh, Waco. During the 56 days of the standoff, um, they spoke to David Koresh 117 times on the phone for a total of 60 hours. They spoke to Steve Schneider, his top deputy, 459 separate telephone calls during the 56 days for a period totaling 90 hours. So about um, uh, 600 call, telephone calls just with those two. Uh, different negotiators were used. Um, all of the negotiations were taped and transcribed. Um, one, of our, one of the three of us listened to all the tapes. I read all the transcripts. We quote very, very um, uh, extensively from the transcripts in our report. Um, what emerges from the transcripts is not so much a negotiation, but I would say kind of a uh, little bit of a cat and mouse game. Um, Koresh was, a, was, was an extremely intelligent, very, very um, uh, a, a, a person gifted with a, a photographic memory. He had pretty much memorized the New Testament. And he had a great ability to quote from different portions of the New Testament um, in um, a, a technique that, that, that was quite impressive to his followers, where, where he was able to do what he called kind of rationalizing or connecting different portions of the scriptures together. Um, during the During the uh, negotiations, you hear me okay? During the negotiations, Koresh uh, was, was um, either preaching to the agents, you know, you don't understand the scripture, let me explain the scripture to you, let me quote scripture to you, let me tell you about the book of Revelations, which was really his expertise, and in particular the seven seals. And ultimately, a lawyer was hired to represent uh, Mr. Koresh, a, a very, very a terrific lawyer named Dick DeGuerin, very famous Texas lawyer. And he then took over the negotiations with the FBI. And he pleaded with the FBI uh, to allow time for Koresh to finish a book that Koresh was writing in which Koresh would unlock the secret of the Seven Seals. And so kind of at the end of the standoff, this became kind of, I'm working on the book. I need more time. Uh, well, how far along are you? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Well, how many of the seals have you unlocked? You don't understand. That's not a relevant question. So it became kind of a, a sort of a, a, a circular process with, with no end in sight. The negotiators we talk in our, in our report uh, would have liked to, to keep negotiating, whereas the hostage rescue team felt that after 56 days, given everything else that was known, it was time to move in. The attorney general was aware, was well aware that there was this tension uh, within the FBI, and this is all fully discussed in our report. Uh, Steve, as uh, Jeff mentioned in his introductory remarks, and as you mentioned, uh, we're going to move now to the bombing of the Murrah office building in Oklahoma City about two years later to the day. Uh, how did you become involved in the federal investigation with respect to the bombing of the uh, Murrah office building? So I mentioned that, that um, I had been in Washington and moved back to Los Angeles. Can you all hear me? OK. Moved back to Los Angeles at the end of uh, 1993, early 1994. Was working as, here as the chief assistant US attorney. On April 19th, 1995, that morning, I was on an airplane. from. I was in Washington for business for our office. 
was flying back, and it was an early flight, so the plane landed at around noontime, LA time, and I got in the, my car and turned on the KNX and heard, all, of course, all the breaking news about Oklahoma City and that there, were, uh, there was a, uh, an apparent connection to a Middle Eastern terrorist group with ties in London and that the FBI was looking for this Middle Eastern terrorist that they thought was responsible. And I, I pulled over, and I actually, I had a cell phone then, an early cell phone, um, maybe a harbinger of my future career. And I, I called the, uh, lo, the head of the FBI office in Los Angeles. And I said, I could be like really off base here, and I know you guys are super busy, you're already with this investigation, but just keep in mind, today is the second anniversary of the Waco fire. And I have a feeling that there's a connection to Waco. I don't know why, but I just have a feeling. And it turned out, just gut instinct, uh, somehow or another, that was conveyed to Washington. But really, because I had uh, been involved in the original investigation, I had interviewed the Attorney General. I think that she felt that I was apolitical, that I had no interest in the outcome one way or the other in 1993, that I could be a credible person to represent her in 1995. Remember, in 1994, the Republicans swept the midterm elections and took control of both the House and the Senate. And so the congressional investigation in 1995 was led by, I said, two congressional committees that merged together, both Republican-led. And I had worked, as I mentioned earlier, originally for the uh, um, uh, first Bush Attorney General, William Barr, and Bob Mueller, Republican. So I had good ties and good relations with both sides. I was truly bipartisan, and I still hope that, I, 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 that I'm thought of that way to this day. And as a result, I was able to work with the Republican staff, make sure that we were producing all the documents that they wanted, make sure that we were making available all the witnesses that they wanted to talk to. Um, the, in particular, one of the two committees, subcommittees, was led by uh, Congressman Bill McCollum from Florida, who was the chair of the <coughs> crime subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee, led by <coughs> Congressman Henry Hyde from Illinois. Congressman McCollum was uh, from Florida, as was Attorney General Reno, and they were not friends. They were not allies. They were on opposite sides of pretty much every issue. But I will say that as tough as he was on us, Congressman McCollum and his staff were uh, extraordinarily fair uh, they were harsh, they were critical, but they were extremely fair uh, in, their, uh, in our dealings with them. Uh, there were some other very politicized things that happened during the hearing, as, as, as is prone to happen in a congressional hearing. Both the Democrats, uh, who were very vigorously defending the Attorney General, the Republicans, some of them, some of them, who were trying to trip up the Attorney General, uh, were, were engaging in, in some political theatrics, let's say. Our focus was the facts to make sure that all the facts came out, as many, as many facts as we were aware of, uh, to make sure that uh, the pre presentation that we made to the Congress was as credible as it could possibly be. Steve, how did you prepare for those congressional hearings? Uh, what did you prepare? Did you have some pre-sense of what the content would be of their inquiry? Well, um, we knew because um, passions really at that time were, were, were so high. I mean, we had lost 168 people in the, at that time, the worst uh, attack on uh, mainland U.S. soil. Of course, Pearl Harbor uh, exceeded that. And years later, of course, 9-11 exceeded that. But 168 people, I mean, you remember President Clinton going to Oklahoma City and comforting the victims' families. Um, we had been through the first World Trade Center. We had been through Ruby Ridge. There was this extraordinary suspicion of the federal government. And we were approaching also the end of the millennium. And there was quite a lot of um, activity around the country, uh, people thinking that something apocalyptic was going to happen. I'm not talking about the Y2K computer problem. But there were, there were, there were quite a few groups, the Covenant of the Sword and the Arm of the Lord in Arkansas. We had some other apocalyptic groups elsewhere. And so I think that the Republicans in the Congress should be commended for saying, we need to do a complete reinvestigation of what happened at Waco so that the public can have a full airing of this and the public can understand why it was 
that McVeigh and Nichols were so angry that they would make a bomb with fertilizer and fuel oil and put it inside a Ryder truck and blow it up in front of this building, which had a daycare center on the ground floor. What would make them so? We've got to come clean to the public once and for all about what happened at Waco. So I knew that that was where the investigation, the congressional hearings were going. How did we prepare? We put a team together of a career, not political, but career lawyers at the Justice Department. As I said, I reached out immediately to the staff to make sure that we were completely in sync because I wanted to make sure that, that as often happens in Washington, D.C., it turns out not to be about the underlying event, but the, the cover-up or you hid documents or you didn't tell us that. I wanted to make sure that, that we were completely uh, uh, cooperative and providing everything to the Republican staff that they needed. So that was one of my top priorities. I also needed to make sure that as the, the attorney for the Justice Department, the Attorney General, the FBI, that I worked very closely with uh, all of our uh, colleagues and, and people who were who had a stake in this. Um, and this, this required me to interact with um, the White House, with the FBI, with the Justice Department. Um, and there were a few times when I said to the White House, um, this is going to be based on the facts, and we're going to have to let the facts fall where they fall. Um, on the morning of the hearing, uh, a hurricane struck South Florida that day. And uh, Attorney General Reno was quite concerned about the well-being of her relatives in South Florida. She testified in the morning uh, by herself. We walked into the hearing room together, me with her. Uh, we sat down at the table. She sat down. I sat down behind her. And all of a sudden, there was a rush of cameras that came up to the front where you're sitting uh, in a semicircle, maybe 50 cameras taking pictures. There were news cameras. They were broadcasting this. So she testified all morning. And then we had lunch. We came back after lunch. And uh, there, were, there were certain points where the testimony and the exchanges were, were, were quite heated and quite tense. And she was still very concerned about her, her family. She had had reports that they were OK during the lunch hour. Uh, the hurricane was subsiding. Uh, and then at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we'd been going all day, uh, Congressman Sonny Bono walked into the hearing room. He was not a member of either committee, but he wanted to ask a question, the late Congressman Sonny Bono. And uh, he made a mistake. He had actually a very fair point. He wanted to ask about the lethality of the tear gas that was used that day. I mentioned that it was CS gas, uh, orthochlorobenzylidine malononitrile, for you chemists. Um, it's the same gas that the British Army had used in, in Belfast. It's the same gas, actually, that um, uh, the uh, uh, National Guard and the Baltimore police are prepared to use tonight if there is more trouble. It's the same exact gas. Um, and he misread his question, and he made a mistake in the way he asked the question, kind of an embarrassing mistake. Uh, and when that happened, it all kind of happened in, in one moment. But I saw some of the cameramen touching their earpieces, and then I saw them packing up their cameras and leaving the room. And I knew at that point that, uh, for all practical purposes, um, the editors back at CBS and CNN and NBC had decided that it was no longer newsworthy to be in the room. And because they had decided it was no longer newsworthy, I realized really at that moment that the Attorney General would, would survive that day. Uh, and indeed, she served out uh, the rest of her term until President Clinton left office uh, for another um, four years. So that was what it was like. Steve, one final question before we uh, adjourn to the reception in the room just outside. This is really going to be a a two-part question. Uh, first part is, what was it like uh, being a U.S. attorney uh, working for the Department of Justice in the midst of a very heated congressional uh, investigation? And secondly, I know uh, you've gone on to an illustrious career in the private sector, but I know that you have friends and you maintain contact and friendships with people uh, in the U.S. Department of Justice. Would you urge young people who decide to become attorneys to pursue a career uh, in the Justice Department? So I'll take the second question first. I would, I would urge, and I've spoken, I've met with several students who are here in the audience uh, over the last few days, um, and they've heard me say this. I, I believe that any career in public service um, is a worthwhile endeavor for lawyers, especially at the, at the beginning of one's career, whether it's prosecution or defense, 
public defender, prosecutor, state, federal, local, um, or working for uh, a public service organization that may have nothing to do with, with criminal law, uh, ACLU, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, whatever it might be. I think it's the highest calling for lawyers to have some element of public service in their career. I think it certainly for me has helped temper my approach in the private sector to always keep in mind that there are uh, people, less fortunate people, who have needs. And I've always tried during my career uh, in the corporate world to, to be mindful of that and to give back. As far as representing the Attorney General um, in a congressional hearing, clearly it was quite um, uh, uh, a high wire act, if you could say, uh, with so much media attention and, and so much at stake. But what really, what really grounded me was um, uh, some fan really uh, fantastic advice that I had received earlier in my career from my first uh, boss in the law, uh, a fellow who is still alive, 92 years old, Seth Hufstedler. Uh, his wife, Shirley, was uh, his law partner. She was the first woman ever to be a federal appellate judge. President Johnson appointed her to the Ninth Circuit. And Mr. and Mrs. Hufstedler both told me when I joined their law firm in downtown LA in 1983 that um, it's very important as you go through your career um, to uh, be honest, uh, be credible, do the right thing, do the right thing, um, and, and to be yourself. And I took those values with me that, um, that I received from Mr. and Mrs. Hufstedler into my job at the Justice Department when I was a prosecutor here doing drug cases, and when I was, def and when I was, uh, I was almost going to say defending, but not defending, uh, acting as the lawyer for the United States Department of Justice, and letting the chips fall wherever they were going to fall. Because ultimately, my client in that situation was not Ms. Reno, it was not DOJ, uh, but it was the people of the United States who deserved a full accounting um, of what happened uh, that day in, in, in Waco. Um, now look, I, I just want to conclude by saying that um, uh, I do appreciate deeply how uh, controversial this issue remains. And as I said before, I do not claim to be the last word on this. I do not claim to have all the answers. Um, there are still people who legitimately uh, are looking at similar events in our history, the Kennedy assassination, the Martin Luther King Jr. assassination. Waco is one of those uh, benchmark events in American history that will continue to be looked at. I just wanted to give you on the 20th anniversary of Oklahoma City some of my impressions from the time and kind of a, a look at the public record as we, as we know it to exist to hopefully stimulate uh, future thought and future research into these issues. Thank you very much.